Thank you. Good evening, everybody here on Tel Aviv, and good um, afternoon, is it? All the way in the US. I'm here only to present the wonderful Gilly Bar Hillel and Delia Sherman. Delia is uh, our special guest tonight. She is a wonderful author whom um, I only had the time to read two books and I loved both of them. So I can say with conviction uh, that she's a wonderful author. And Gilly Bar Hillel, whom we all know here in our little community, is uh, both the publisher behind Woods Publishing House that many of our kids grow, grow on and the translator of Harry Potter, which many of us grown-ups have, have, have had, sorry, English not my first language, or second, have grown upon, on, never mind, oh, you, you will correct me. Oh. And I will uh, now clear the stage for Gilly to have the talk with Delia, and I hope you have a lovely evening. Happy Icon. Thank you, Nomi. Hi, <laughs> Thank Delia. You. <laughs> Hi, Speedy. How are you? <laughs> oh, I'm a little bit, uh, I think, bittersweet. I'm very, very, very happy to see you. And I'm happy to participate in this event. Uh, but I'm a little bit sad that it's not an in-person event and that it's been such a long time since we've been able to meet in person. Um, and I think the last time we met in person was in Dublin. Yes. Uh, the, yes. the world con in dublin in august so that was two years ago yeah and yeah. then before that in tel aviv when you were here at icon so I, I was counting in my head how many different cities i've met delia and her wife ellen in starting with our very first meeting in san francisco and in tel aviv and in dublin and in new york and in paris and in helsinki and I, I, I reached England. In England. Yeah, um, uh, Newcastle? Um, Newcastle. Well, we, we started in Bristol and then we went, we had the dinner in Newcastle. I didn't even count Newcastle, but that's true. <laughs> so it's, it's a very international uh, friendship. Uh, I think that uh, Delia and Ellen travel a lot and possibly I also travel a lot, but I think of them as being travelers and me just happening to sometimes meet them. Uh, so where are we finding you right now? Where are you now? I'm in Newcastle, Maine. <laughs> Maine. So, uh, so you're not at home. You're not in New York. No, we, what, what we did was we took uh, I, my best friend from first grade, we've been friends since we were six years old, uh, has a house on the coast in Maine. And it's a very beautiful house. And, and uh, we go up usually in the autumn and spend uh, a few days with them and then spend maybe a week or two. I wrote quite a lot of the evil wizard Smallbone because we had spent so much time there. And I looked out and I said, this is magical. This could be a Shangri-La where, where nobody ever comes and except that you can come in from the outside, but you're entering a magical place and nothing there changes. It's, that was it, about to be my next question, was how much of the main you're in right now is the main uh, we read about in The Evil Wizard Smallbone, which in Hebrew is Chanut HaSfarim Shel HaMechashef HaRasha. That, yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 but it's no, it, it, it actually quite a lot of it is because when you come to Maine, if you come in the summer and there are many tourists here and what and they come into a place that has been designed for them and it has pretty little houses and it has nice stores that sell things you don't really need, but you really want and 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 hand knitted socks and wool shops and all of this stuff. And then you leave. Eve and the people and the people are always very polite and very nice and very happy to see you and very cheerful and they're very cheerful about seeing your money and then you leave and it always seems magical and sometimes it rains but frequently the weather is nice and everybody is very positive and and I was thinking about one of those towns when we weren't there 
Uh, but it's what it's like behind the scenes <laughs> <exactly>. in winter. <laughs> yeah. And and what it would be, what what it what, what it would be like to live there if you were under the the sway of an evil wizard who lived in a house that we used to pass, but we did not stay in, which was like a castle somebody had built. Oh, it so the house is real. It was well. It, I added a few rooms, but, <laughs> but it was it was kind of it was one of those Victorian houses like Edward Gorey, the, the with the with the, the tall clock tower thing in the center and many porches, and it was just one of these things that had lots of roofs and lots of chimneys. And I just added a little bit onto it because it was a magic house, and um, and I gave our, I gave them our view. Uh, that I see when I'm in the bedroom that that we're, we stay in when we're there, and um, and and the woods look very much like the woods. But he has no neighbors, um, and my friend has neighbors, uh, so it it was physically very much where I was staying. And I was very interested in Maine has a very different. It has a culture of its own. It has ways of speaking of its own. It has an accent of its own, although many of the older people, only the older people use it pretty much. You don't hear that many young people who speak that way anymore. Um, but there's a, there's a fair where you go and you, you see the, and there are many people who have farms. They raise goats. They raise lots of goats. They raise <laughs> cows. <laughs> they raise uh, pigs. Um, they have some ca characters in the book as well. Yes, yeah, and, and I can uh, testify that Yelachmon really attempted to recreate the sort of the special sort of dialect that you were giving the characters. It's hard to do in translation, but she gave it. She gave it a shot. She absolutely tried. That's wonderful. I'm so glad because it's so colorful. <laughs> It's, it's really hard to do, but, you know, but give a little bit of flavor and quaintness to the expressions and, and make them a little out of the ordinary in a particular direction. Um, that's the best we can do in translation sometimes. The, the yeah. thing that I had the most fun when I was writing that book was he this he, because he's an evil wizard. It says so on his business card of course. Um, that he <laughs> that, that he he says uh, he, he likes to, to, to make threats um, to his the, the hero of the book who is uh, who was 12. He's, he's quite young. And he keeps saying things like, I'll turn you into a slug and, and, and salt you. I'll turn you into bread and toast you, you know, and, and it's just all of these things. And it was so much fun to make them up. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine that sometimes the character sort of takes you over and tells you, you need to, <laughs> you need to give me some more opportunities to stick in these colorful expressions. Oh, well, he, yeah, he was pretty crabby. <laughs> So I, I guess for, you know, for Israelis in Israel, Maine is just as exotic as Paris or as London. I mean, we can, we can see it in nature programs, we can read about it in books, but we don't open the book and say, oh, I was here last week and this is a place that I know. Um, whereas in, in some of your books, I just uh, uh, prepared for the session by, by reading uh, Changeling, which I hadn't read before, which I'm sorry I hadn't read before because I loved it. And Changeling is a love song to Manhattan. It's all about the city of New York and the, you know, the, the different uh, characters of the different neighborhoods. So, um, so I was wondering, I mean, I, how much is location, what, what comes first? Do you think of a story first and then decide where to put it? Or does the story sort of grow out of the location? It always starts, I mean, oddly enough, people say I start with a character, I start with this, I start with an idea. I, I do start with a location and, and the location of wherever I have written about. I wrote, I wrote a Changeling because I was living in Massachusetts. I had been living in Massachusetts for 30 years and I never felt home, at home there. And I was so homesick for New York. Um, and I, so I just started thinking about all of the things that the, the books there are written about New York, the places that I grew up in. And because it was a magic New York I was writing about, I'm writing about the, I, what the, the central idea of, of the book is that there is a New York that 
I walk around in. And then there is a New York that is between that and the rest of the universes in the world and called New York between. And it's where you're not looking at the time. It's, it's fairy New York. And that's where all of the folklore that all of the immigrants from all of the countries that are that, that where, where people have come to New York and come live there, their folklore has come to live there too. And that's where it lives. And even though um, they're, they're immortal beings and they're, they've always been, they, they've been there ever since the, the immigrants came, they have, New York has changed them just as New York changes everybody who lives there. And that's what it was about. So I had um, a lot of Russian folklore in it because there's a very, especially where I live, um, which I had her living in Central Park, but I live right next to the river. There, there It was originally settled by a lot of Russian uh, Jewish immigrants. Uh, so there's, there's some, there's characters from that. Um, and then I used some of the, the the characters from books that people have written about New York. Eloise. Um, I, Eloise. <laughs> and I love that you that you uh, put them at the same level of, you know, folklore and authored characters and even things like just kind of urban legends um, and Broadway legends. And they're all fodder. They're all grist for the mill. Well, they're they're all part of what makes New York New York, and they're all part of what people know in their hearts is true, and that's what folklore is. You know, you it, it has nothing to do with your head. It it it's it's what you feel is true, and so it, and I think that some of them are perhaps I was going to put in Stuart Little, but I was afraid that people who he was a uh, E.B. White wrote a story about a, a mouse that has a character and a personality and is brought up by human beings and go and then sails a boat in Central Park. Um, yeah. And I wow. used Wind in the Willows because I thought that children would be more, I, I think that that's a book that has lasted longer. And I, I don't know how many people read Stuart Little now, but I wanted something that almost all children at least know something about Wind in the Willows because there's been a television program. No, well, so, I never know. Uh, it's one of the things that as, children's, uh, as a children's translator, we're always expected to anticipate what do kids know and what is familiar and, and, and how do we localize something and make it more familiar. But it, we, we're always guessing what kids do and don't know and, and what. I just went for what I liked best. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and frankly, I liked I liked Ratty better than I liked Stuart <laughs> <laughs> So one thing that you told me about uh, the evil, evil wizard Smallbone that surprised me was that British publishers thought it was too American and that it wouldn't go over well in England. Um, how do you feel? Did, was Changeling published in the UK? No, I've, yeah, I've, it, it, it hasn't been. It was, it was the only things that, the only thing I have ever had foreign editions are for our Freedom Maze, which was, um, which was set in Louisiana and was about, um, uh, it was a time travel novel about going back in time to 18, it was set in 1960. Uh, and, and it was, and she traveled back in time to, to 1860, uh, where when it was slavery times in 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 Louisiana, and she went back on her her grandparents' plantation. But because she was dressed like a little 60s girl in a you know in a cotton short cotton dress, and she had had a suntan, uh, they took her for a slave. Um, a part of the family, but still a slave. So that that was my way of dealing with my my mother came from Louisiana. So and a lot of my family, their politics are not mine, shall we say? <laughs> <laughs> their their attitude towards people who don't look like them is something we don't talk about very much. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, sometimes uh, that we need to so, talk so around. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I was trying to work through that history in my own way. By so, telling the story so Louisiana is also a setting that is personal to you. It, and, and did you 
um, draw from memories, from your mother's stories, from from being there? What, what was what kind of research did you uh, draw? I did from? a lot. Well, I read a, I read a great deal because I read I I read a great deal of history. I read a lot of memoirs. Um, I read a lot of the the slave narratives that that were um, that were collected by. Uh, during the Great Depression, they they were they went down and talked to a lot of the slaves because it was it was make work, but they were paid for it. And now we've got these wonderful narratives of what people said their lives were like, uh, who had been enslaved people. So that was I did a great deal of that. I went in Louisiana. We went to several living history museums, and they had just started working on this is what it was like in what they used to call the servants quarters um, <laughs> because this is still the south you know <laughs> you commit this you know mm -hmm. and, and they this was this was long enough ago where they still had the statues of everybody and they still flew the confederate flag and i mean it was very it was very strange doing some of this research but um i went to um i went to tulane and looked up um the magazines and the newspapers in which they would advertise for runaway slaves. And I mean, I did a lot of, I did a lot of research, uh, but the, all of the family stuff, um, I, I pretty much got from my mother's family, not the facts, but the attitudes and the, the patterns and the characters, but not, but there is not a single fact that I can point to and say, my family did that because, you know, I don't know. Um, that was a really long time ago. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so, so your mother grew up in Louisiana. Well, she actually grew up in Texas, but, but the, but most of the, a lot of the family, the family is all over the South. Um, and, and a lot of, most of the family that was still alive, and was had settled in part, different parts of Louisiana. So I used to go down and spend my sometimes uh, Easter vacation or just when I had a little time off from school, um, it, we, my mother would take me down to visit my cousins in, 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 um, in Sulfa, Louisiana. <laughs> But so, so she's from Louisiana and grew up in Texas and you mostly grew up in New York, I understand. Uh, but you were born in Tokyo. How did that happen? Well, there was this thing called the Korean War. <clears throat> did they play MASH at, it was MASH on television? It may have been, uh, I don't even remember. <laughs> well, I think we know MASH not as well as Americans do. It's not our trauma. Well, because yeah. uh, the usual thing that I say is that my 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 mother was hot lips and my father was Hawkeye. Um, I, I'm <laughs> I'm the daughter. I, I was adopted, um, and I am the daughter of an of, of an army nurse and um, a doctor. And I now have found my mother's family, but I have no way of finding my father's. You mean your biological mother's family? Yeah. Oh, really? Is this recent? It was in the past few years. It was ever since two, three, and me when you spit into a test tube and they discover your DNA. Right. And I found a first cousin and I talked to her and she said, well, yes, and I am the only person that your mother ever said, ever told me that she had a child. Um, oh, my goodness. That, you know, that's, there's a story right there. I know, I know, I've heard so many stories of people who discovered family secrets and maybe things that they weren't that happy to uncover. But sometimes there are happier meetings, I guess, and you can expand well, my, your family, yeah. My cousin is delightful. None of the other rest of the family wants to talk to me and that's okay um, because they sound as if they might be a little bit, well, as, as my cousin said, they are, they are people of a very decided personality. <laughs> I... So again, I'm, the, the theme that I'm coming back to is location and, and how it affects your writing. And I know that you like going on retreats to write. And by you, I mean, not just you, but Ellen as well. And, and the two of you had your uh, regular locations that you would visit. 
uh, in what is it in New England and New Mexico as well? Am I right? Or uh, Arizona? Arizona, right? You and go in, where we know people, yeah. And in Paris, you had this amazing year in Paris as well. How did that come about? I have always wanted to spend a year abroad. I have always wanted to spend an entire twelve months being elsewhere. And mm-hmm. and I really we we both love Paris. Ellen's has Ellen spent a year in Paris with her parents. Her father had a job there for one year when Ellen was seven, so she speaks very fluent French. Um, it's her vocabulary is that of a of a. a a, a child, but her accent is perfect. (laughs) So everybody who talks, all the French people who talk to her are like, where do you come from? And are you (laughs) quite all right? (laughs) Um, But it's really, we both really love it. And we had been to science fiction conventions there. We both have had books translated into French. And so we had uh, ties and friendships in the science fiction community in, in, in France. And so when we got there, we had a community to be part of and we had friends. So we weren't, we weren't um, stuck with the American community. We weren't isolated and we rented an apartment and we lived there for um night we 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 lived there for a year and we traveled around a little bit in france and we went various places but mostly we were in paris Uh, and i had been writing a book about the franco-prussian war and um they that and so I I decided I and I put it away because it was too hard to write it's not a children's book um and there's a lot of research involved and so I thought well you're going to be in Paris for a year you might as well work on this book so um I'm I'm getting to the last section now (laughs) and you also had uh you went to a ball at Versailles didn't you you attended a proper 18th century what is there is there a is it defined the time period for the ball it has to be sometime during the monarchy <laughs> <laughs> so and it's supposed to be so, so i a friend of ours in in um in, in chagford in england in a small town in england and we have gone there for a writing retreat too um in in a, in a cottage uh, has her mother-in-law is a costumer, a theatrical costumer, and she has an entire attic full of costumes. So she brought down all of these costumes and we got, and she dressed us up. <laughs> well, you get to play dress up. I mean, that's the best thing. You, you're an adult, you are fully grown adults and you get to play the best dress up game I've ever heard of. The pictures and, were amazing. And, and you guys must really understand this because there was a lot of really wonderful costuming at, um, at, at, at Icon when we were there, but everybody was doing it from slightly different periods. And some, sometimes they had like the, the hoop skirts with the big pannier on the side and, and the big hair, except it was purple or they wore the hoop skirt on the outside of the dress or that the, they allow you, as long as you're trying, you can deconstruct it. <laughs> but no, I think there, were also, there were also people who had spent all year making their costumes. Amazing. That part, part of the thing for them was to sew an entire historically accurate costume, including the underwear, by hand. I think there are different approaches to cosplay, and there are the what those who go for authenticity and are I, our representative that I think of, uh, who often speaks at ICON about uh, peri- period costumes, is also the translator in Bal Sagiv Nakdimon, who you met, um, and she's into authenticity, and we'll talk about that. And then there's really fantasy uh, costuming that is mashups, that is you know steampunk or taking two different fandoms and melding them together, or just wearing something that you think is cool and making up a story about that. And that's a different approach, but it's all, you know, fun and games. And I think that the Versailles ball is more of the accurate. Uh, no, it was, it? it depended on who it was. The, 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 the people who were the most fantastical were the Japanese. There were a lot of Japanese there. 
Oh. They were, because they love the 18th century and they love being, they, 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 they love getting dressed up. Um, and, and there was a, a woman with her little boy, he must have been 10 or 11, and she had him dressed perfectly too. And they and she was and she was showing him a dance because there was music everywhere and she, and they were doing a dance at the end of the hall just just as if they were alone in the building and and I just was absolutely enchanted by this and the, and also so and she was perfect I mean she could have just stepped out of the picture if you if 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 there had, if they had been Japanese in the 18th century she would have been it and then nearby was this young Japanese man who was, you know, very, very handsome, wearing this fantastical costume that was in some ways very accurate, in some ways was a fever dream. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they were both enchanting, you know. <laughs> oh, I should write a story about that. You should, you should. That's <laughs> that, that's my next thing is, so when are you writing about this? And and, and about fantastical Paris. I mean, I know that you've set already, uh, the porcelain dove is set in France and you said you're working on another novel that's also for adults that's set in France. It's not fantastic at all. It's, it's, it's a historical novel. It's about, um, it, it's, it's about what, it's about the people history happened to. It's about the ordinary people who have to put up with the political decisions that the big guys have made. <laughs> and when, uh, when, when they have other plans for their lives, you know, like the past two years. <laughs> oh, gosh, yes. So you have, you have different. So you've written you've written uh, books that would be, I guess, defined as middle grade. That is, um, they're not really books for older teenagers but books for school-aged kids and you've written adult novels and lots of short stories that I think are mostly adult short stories right they're mostly yeah and... there, there are there, there are a couple of, of young adult um because they were for YA anthologies so they have protagonists who are in their teens and then you also write in these collaborative worlds like Tremontaine and and the book you wrote with uh, with Ellen and uh and I, I, do you do you do you think yourself I mean this is something that I think of you too as being sort of mentors who are growing another generation of writers do you see yourself in that position as well well I I absolutely do partly because I'm a teacher um, I, I, before I started writing, I was a teacher and I taught, I taught writing. I taught freshman composition. I taught expository prose, heaven help us all. Uh, <laughs> but I discovered that I much preferred to teach people who really wanted to be in my class. Um, and when you're teaching creative writing, mostly they do want to be there uh, and they're really interested and they want to do the work. Uh, and it's been it's been lovely. I've I've taught in, in a number of different, mostly workshops, not full time. Um, and it and it's and it's great because you you're it's a very intense experience for a limited amount of time, and then you know you go your separate ways. But you've made friends, so you get people who write you years later. You get people who put you in the acknowledgments of their books when you don't even remember remember having that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I just per, watching these young people and some people who aren't so young, but are young as writers, um, learning how to create their craft and how to, how, which rules can be broken, how they can modify things, how they can make something that is old new again in their, in their hands is just, I mean, it's glorious. It's, it's wonderful. What do you enjoy more, writing or watching other people develop their writing? It's not, it's there. I, I, I really like apples and I, well, I'm not that fond of oranges, but lemons, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm completely down with lemons. Um, you know, it's, they, they, they give you very different joys and you, they, they allow you a balance because when you're writing, it's you and the page. I mean, yes, there is an implied reader, but basically you're 
creating something out of, it's very internal. You're the only one who, even, even if you talk to somebody about it, this is not a performance. Um, and and at, at heart, teaching is a performance. And so it's, it's, it's that, that give and take and when you're, and, and it's an improvisation, no matter, even if you know your lines, if the, the, the joy of teaching is that a student can say something and you can go, yeah, you're right. Let's talk about that. And it's something you haven't thought of before. That's lovely. That's absolutely. So, so for, for me, teaching is a, con is a collaboration and it's very, it's very, externally motivated it's 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 extra and the writing is intra and i think between the two of them i get to balance i get to balance how do you manage your time how do you you know do you carve out writing hours are there days that you say i'm going to be writing it or, or does it just happen nothing just happens <laughs> <laughs> Especially as you get older. <laughs> um, what I do is 40 minutes. When, when I realize that I have not been writing and that I make excuses and that I'm getting crabby because I do get crabby if I don't write. Um, what I, and, but I, I just can't find the time. There's laundry, there's this, there's that. I have to do this, I have to do that. And then I say, okay, you can do anything for 40 minutes a day. You can do anything for 40 minutes. And so I'm going to set my timer and for 40, 40 minutes. And I cannot get up. I cannot turn on the computer. I do it longhand. Oh, um, really? and I just write for 40 minutes. This is me. There other people have picked this up and they and they type um, and, and they use the computer. But you have to be sure that that's all you're doing and you don't stop and say, this isn't any good. Frequently, I start when I don't know what the next scene is going to be about and say, you know, I don't know what the scene is going to be about. I'm pretty sure these people are going to be in it. And I know they have to do something. And I know that they have to get to this thing that I have planned for them to do two chapters down the road. And so maybe how, how on earth are they going to get there? I don't know. Um, maybe they could do this. And then by the time I get to the end of the 40 minute, well, I, the, by the time I get to the end of the page, frequently I have started a scene. And then and I, copy it out onto the computer later and rewrite yeah. it and do it. Yeah. Um, and that's, that, that, that's how I write anyway, is that I, I do all of my first drafts longhand um, because that's how I learned to write. And although I probably could train myself to do it on the computer, um, I'm 70 years old. I am not, I'm not really in in this for a learning curve you know well, if you're 70 years old oh my goodness you're, you're, you're timeless you are timeless wow <laughs> but you know but my my I just realized my daughter is 18 my son is 19 and I'm no spring chicken so I guess it's possible but you don't you absolutely don't feel 70 <laughs> in your spirit now uh, so what are you writing right now Right this minute, I'm still writing the en the, the 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 endless French novel. Yeah, um, and that's all I'm. I, it's 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 a huge. It, it's it's a long book. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> what you described sounds, you know, it sounds like it's kind of rough, and and that people, you know, and that there might be tragedy involved. Does that ever get you down? Do you do you feel that like you need to take some time off to disconnect from it or well yes and no I mean you get tired I've been working on this book now for several for a number of years and you've got to you've, you've got to do everything other things from time to time anyway but it, one of the things is that it has been born in upon me you know living a certain amount of time through certain things that there's always funny things happen even in tar in horrible times and so I'm not writing Yes, this is a reasonably grim novel, but it is not grim dark. <laughs> there are scenes where people have a good time. I, right now, in historically in Paris, in the middle of a war when they were being bombed by other Frenchmen because it was the commune, um, they, they had a gingerbread fair for several weeks. 
and they, the uh, <laughs> no, yeah, because every every year around Easter for a month, there was this fair traditionally for hundreds and hundreds of years from I think the first one was in like 1300 and something. And it was always more or less in the same place. And there were circuses, there were dance troops, there were bands, there was, and there was, and there were, you know, those stamped gingerbread that the, not, not the fluffy cakey stuff, but the, but the flat gingerbread, they would stamp it out in different shapes. And the traditional one from that part of France was the pig. So you, you got little gingerbread pigs and you would buy gingerbread pigs and they cost practically nothing. And it was in a poorer part of town and the richer people would come there to a sort of uh, slum, you know, to, to, to see how the other, the other half lived and to have a good time and not have to be ladies and gentlemen. And everybody else just went there to have a good time. And they had tightrope walkers and contortionists and, um, and, and, you know, tableau vivant where people were standing around pretending to be statues and all of the and horse races and swings. Um, you were for, for grownups because that was really thrilling in 1850. <laughs> and oh, yeah, you need to know what you're fighting for as well. So I suppose that in the middle of this thing, there's this fair. So I thought, well, I'm going to set a scene there because why not? <laughs> which, which of your books would you most like to have translated into Hebrew that hasn't been yet? I, I think, I don't know, Changeling. <laughs> I, I don't know whether or not um, the Freedom Maze would translate. I mean, I'm not sure how that would how that would work, but, um, you know. Yeah, these things, again, um, as translator for children, we're always trying to second guess. We're always trying to to think, how will kids understand this? Um, and, uh, and, but again, Manhattan is just as exotic as slavery, Louisiana, possibly kids have visited Manhattan, but a lot of the people that we're translating for haven't. And yes, but they've seen for- TV, they've uh, seen yeah. TV and, and so much of, of television that leaves America is set in, in New York. But the question is, maybe then it's important to show these uh, parts of history that we aren't as proud of and that are a bit painful. Um, And maybe we should be seeking out these eras. There's an Israeli author. Now I can only see her face in front of my eyes. And of course, her name is now eluding me, um, who writes about... Um, Tamar Verite Zehavi is her name and she writes about historical characters um, uh, everyone from Mandela to uh, you know human rights activists um, over history Gandhi she's written about she's written about Martin Luther King and she also writes about Uh, contemporary affairs in Israel and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict sometimes. And those books are not popular. But the books that she writes about slavery and about human rights violations in other countries, in dark countries, um, those are acceptable in the education system in Israel. Well, I, I, you know, my feeling very strongly is one reason that fantasy and science fiction are both important and useful and popular. So that's three things, but whatever. Um, It is because we can work through, you can work through when you're writing it and you can work through when you're reading it, some very difficult emotional and political matters, but it's not yours. You have no dog in this fight. It's it's happening out there long it far in uh, long long ago in a galaxy far far away it's happening it's happening in New York which is practically mythological anyway because because it's on television all the time it's in 
it's in Shangri-La, which doesn't even exist. Um, it, it that mm -hmm. allows you, it's like fairy tales. It happened once upon a time and it allows you to, to come to grips with things that are difficult and painful without, with, without having to engage with it at the same level that when you're talking about your neighbors. Without having to become defensive, without coming into it with baggage and with preconceptions and, oh, I'm being manipulated here because it's, it's all abstract. Yeah, oh, I've lost you. So we have how much? How much time do we have still? Sorry, five more minutes, and you have five questions minutes. from the others. Um, how do I see the questions from others? I'm happy to share with you. There was essentially a question about if there are going to be more books translated from Delia. <laughs> we'll see. We will see. We will see. Uh, Delia, I really hope so. <laughs> will you? Will you be writing more about um, Smallbone and that? I'm not oh. really very much for sequels. I, I, I found, I tried to write a, a, a series with the New York Between books and I wrote the second one. And when I wrote the third one and sent it to the publisher, I didn't finish the third one. I had a proposal. And um, because the, in, in the first book, the, the, the heroine whose name is Neef has to, um, has to have, perform three tasks and two of those tasks clearly have repercussions that could happen along the line. And so what I wanted to do is a trilogy. And I wrote the first when she was, she had stolen a mirror from the, from, from, from the mermaid queen. And um, so she, but anyway, that, that didn't do very well. So well, I sent in the, the, the proposal for the second one and they said, they, they, I don't think they even read it, but they, they turned it the down. The third one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, another question? Gabby or someone? More no questions question. at this time, but thank you. No questions at this time. So, yeah, so uh, I really enjoyed the, the, the Changeling world. And I'm, I was just wondering if it's too New York, if it's something, uh, <laughs> that's the question I've been asking again and again, is, is, this, is the fact that this location is unfamiliar an advantage or a disadvantage? Is it something that will keep kids from really getting all the inside jokes because there are a lot of inside jokes about the Dow Jones falling. And uh, <laughs> I love those, by the way. Um, or, or is that, you know, just another type of fantasy land that is New York fantasy land? Well, I think that the number of people who understand that um, I have taken the uh, producer of Broadway um, at, at, to, to a, um, uh, a Damon Runyon character, nobody knows that. There's not a child alive who knows that, who, you know, maybe one that we brought up would have, but, um, but it doesn't matter because he's a great character. Yeah. And so, a lot of those inside jokes um, that you don't, it doesn't matter because I try, I, I mean, I may not have succeeded, but what I was trying to do was to milk them for what they actually were rather than what you knew about them. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I enjoyed it tremendously. Um, and, and I enjoy you tremendously. And I'm very, very glad I got this opportunity to meet with you virtually, if not in person and so in two years, that's such a long time. <laughs> it was, and thank you so much for asking me and thank you so much for, uh, for talking to me because it made it very easy to talk to somebody I knew. And um, I, I had a lovely time and I, and I, I wish that I, if, if whoever's out there, I wish that I could see each and every one of you because one of the things that I love about doing this kind of thing is to, is to see the faces and to, make connections and maybe talk afterwards. And I can't do that this time. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So, but so next, so next year, this. please come to Tel Aviv. Next year, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of COVID and we'll, we'll make sure to clean it up. But you have to come to Tel Aviv and bring Ellen, of course. Well, of course. And as, as, as soon as we can, believe me, we'll get there. 
And uh, to all of you following along, then we've been uh, mentioning Ellen again and again, because Delia and Ellen are an inseparable couple, even though each one of them is wonderful in her own, uh, for, in her own sake. But Ellen will uh, presently give a reading and an interview as well. And she she's here wave. with us. Yeah, please wave. Hello. <laughs> Here it comes. Ah! Whoa. Oh, boy. Hi, hi Ellen. <laughs> hi. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. And we'll give you uh, a few minutes to freshen up and, uh, and everyone can gossip about us. And I really do hope to see you in person soon. I yeah. hope so, too. Bye. Yes.